And we are here at Faculty House Columbia University to celebrate the 10th year anniversary of the Gardner Carney Leadership Institute with our partner, the Klingenstein Center at Columbia University. We are just thrilled. We've been in existence for 10 years. We've graduated over 550 people and we're focused on a day and a half of learning about the pedagogy of leadership. How does a teacher, educator, coach, administrator, how does an educator inspire a student to want and be capable of leading? We've got an A list of speakers. We've got, we've got Professor Pearl Kane, director of the Klingenstein Center, our very own Institute scholar, Dr. Joanne Deek. We've got Aaron Gruwell of the extraordinary book and movie Freedom Riders, and Dr. John Medina from Brain Rules. And uh, we are so excited to be here with over 250 educators from across North America. Um, and what I like about the message of GCLI, which I've read incorporated in my leadership classes, is that it can be taught and that it's in every single one of us. And so I try to get the students to actually embrace that, regardless of what they think about themselves as leaders, that they find that there's a little something inside of them that makes them be somewhat worthy of leading. Teachers. It's a fundamental belief of the GCLI that teachers are the last hope. They are the ones that the kids see every day. Teachers are the people who provide the day-to-day -day touch with adults and the adult community. In our society, that's what's left. It's not with the parents. They're both working or whatever. It's not with the churches. It isn't with the, the social groups, it's with the teachers. So we decided that we would recast this notion of what to do about Gardner and commemorating his life through a positive and noble action. And the GCLI was born, and its purpose is to conduct research provide a practicum and to publish and to broadcast the research and information about what we call the pedagogy of leadership. That's really teaching teachers about teaching leadership and that's really about learning and children in the classroom and on the playing field and in the hallways because it's all about relationships and it's all about interaction. You've just asked me how brain science and leadership are connected and how is it that the GCLI has brought those two seemingly disparate ideas together. First, let's talk about leadership. Nobody really knows what that means. And everybody has their own idea and everybody imposes a thought or a concept to the idea. Most people generally think leadership is about Teddy Roosevelt charging up San Juan Hill. And of course it isn't. There was a time in this country, and I'm living proof because it was in my time, where schools taught something called citizenship. Leadership really boils down to a person's place in the community and the person's ability to accept their own responsibility for themselves and to be able to communicate and to relate with others and in fact be able to help them come to a resolution about a common interest or cause or maybe not maybe learning to be a follower but really it's to become a citizen and that seems to be where we have a vacuum in this country today. I mean, I, what I appreciate most is it takes it takes the research from up here and really gets it to the ground sure. level, where the rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. So I'm always interested in application, where kids can actually utilize this right. stuff, demonstrate their knowledge, demonstrate their learning with each other. So to me, this is the most valuable experience I've had. Have you been When I'm asked about brain science and emotion and how they, if they go together or what, what the connection is, I, I really 
I try to be very professional and I try not to laugh because you don't feel in your heart, you feel in your brain. So brain science includes all feelings, all emotion, all morality, all spirituality. You know, if you have a cat, for instance, or maybe two, you don't love them in your heart. You love them in your amygdala, which is in the center part of your brain. And the amygdala and the limbic system, those are the emotional slash motivational centers, are in the lower part of the brain, but they're connected with huge big neurons to all the thinking parts of the brain, called the cortex. And, and having not just thinking about the brain and not having really studied it, people think as soon as you bring up brain or brain science, it's all about thinking. That's only the top part of your brain. And the bottom part is probably, most of us in the field now would say, it is the driving force of the brain. That's why it's got such big neurons that connect it to the thinking part. So how you feel absolutely can enhance or de-enhance your thinking. It can enhance or de-enhance your motivation. It can enhance or de-enhance your capability, your behavior, everything. So if you don't understand the emotional part of your brain, you really can't understand anything. We are surprised by how resilient human beings are and how they tend to keep putting one foot in front of the other. And when they walk into a room, and if you can capture them with the interest of what's going on, with the import of their learning, and with your, the power of your caring for them, they can, for 42 minutes or 60 minutes, set aside that emotional baggage. You know, it kind of gets pushed to the periphery of the brain. And it can be done even for kids who have the most horrendous life outside of the school. We're all a little worried that there wouldn't be anything for us elementary folks, lower school folks here today because we think of student leadership in schools as being about what the student council is up to, what the honor code committee is up to, what the high school seniors or maybe the eighth graders are up to. And I think our eyes were really open today uh, about how much we can contribute to kids developing facets of themselves and being their best selves. Um, I had the privilege of leading a discussion group with um, about 13 educators um, at near the end of the session and the participants were thankful, they were engaged, they were wrestling with questions, they were networking, and just from the energy at that table, I knew it was really successful. So I think so these are individuals who have a vision. I noticed they want to make leadership more intentional, the leadership training, leadership teaching in their schools. What I noticed in my group is that the the teachers or the administrators came from so many different backgrounds. So I had a biologist, and I had a dean of students, and I had an art teacher, and I had a history teacher like myself. They were coming from all different areas with this idea that, with this sense, I should say, that they needed to teach leadership more intentionally. And that's what UCLA offers. And so they were coming here to, I think, just get a taste of what they could experience um, in a more week-long immersion program in the summertime. Smart. Well, my particular perspective is educating female leaders. <laughs> so great. if you look at the statistics, yeah. um, they are downright depressing. Yeah. Um, I like to cite Deborah, Star Deborah Spar, president of Barnard College, her motto or her sort of mantra, which is that, which is the 16% ghetto. So if you look across industries, across um, the political spectrum, you know, any, in any field, um, women's leadership, on average, maxes out at 16%. Um, you know, it varies, say Fortune 500 companies, that's at 3%, and legislature's pretty good now, 20%. But you know, we have five female governors. Like, so to me, um, this is why, this is really my passion, mm -hmm. and um, you know why I, I, I just feel like 
felt like, and I still feel like we have to do a lot of work so that our girls will then leave our cherished institutions and go off and continue to lean in. I know what they're talking about, like <laughs> lecturing's only a bit of it, and I think a lot of it was really applicable. I yeah. think from John, I think the whole idea of uh, theories of mind, and right. I kind of relate that to empathy a lot, and that was something that's thrown around, and really thinking about how to teach that and how to really relate to students. I don't know why that. You know, a big part of, of, of why I do what I do in general is, is to help further other people, um, you know, by just support and encouragement uh, and helping to really foster their passions and their, and their interests and help to bring out the best. And I think it's, uh, it's only going to continue to be, you know, an honor for the GCLI to see all the wonderful things that the grads are doing. Um, and while we had the good fortune of having six or seven back here, uh, I think we easily could have had another 50 uh, if we had room based on all the great stuff that's going on. You know, I went into education uh, based on, you know, the impact that, that my teachers and coaches had on me and truly, I think, uh, saved my life in many ways, um, you know, especially when I was a teenager. And uh, to me, it wasn't because of the, the core academic subjects. And yes, my academic preparation for, um, you know, post-secondary education was important, but it really was kind of their focus on the whole child and on making sure that, um, you know, that, that, that I and my classmates, you know, had the skills and the values and characteristics to hopefully, you know, be able to go out and make a positive difference in the world. And so to me, that's at the core of what great schools do. You know, to me, there's nothing more important than giving them a sense of the opportunities they have to lead and have an impact and, and to really try and use that power in a positive way. I feel like there's so much there's so much that can be done at my school right and there's so many wonderful things at my school but so much to be done and i feel like i'm just one little person and and i know she talked about daring right right go out and be daring and so you have to go be daring well When I was listening to the language that people were using today and the ideas that they were talking about, it reflected so much of what we've talked about over the last 10 years. And they're clearly using this in their schools every day, and it's radically affecting the lives of the kids that they teach. And it's pretty amazing to realize that that's been happening for the last 10 years. I, I hope that they feel confident in doing this hard work because it's messy and challenging and never easy or straightforward. Uh, and if they feel fortified to do it, then I am hopeful that they are going to be able to reach the students that we care so much about and that they're going to make a meaningful difference in the world.